chapter in the book of Hebrews, we're in chapter 8, and really we begin looking at, uh, at verse 6. We're talking about some of the things here that he's, he's talked about, and he's getting to the fact that Christ has a better covenant that he has given unto us than the covenant that was given by uh, Moses. Uh, verse 6 says, But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. It's a new covenant, and the very fact that it's called the new covenant ought to tell us also that, that it's a better covenant than what they had before. Because otherwise, why would God give them a new covenant if it was no better than the old one that they had? Uh, what would be the purpose of that? Uh, that old covenant uh, was simply not able to do what it was intended to do or what needed to be done. And that is... It, that old covenant could not provide salvation for people. All that old covenant could do would be to condemn people for their sins. Look over to the book of Galatians, chapter 3, uh, in verse 21. And really, the book of Galatians has a whole lot to say in, about the contrast between that old covenant and the new covenant that we live under today. Uh, someone read verse 21 for us. If, that's a little word, but it's an important word it uses there. He says, if there had been a law given which, would, which could have given life, then truly righteousness would have been by the law. But it couldn't give life. The old law could not give life. It could only condemn for the sins it would commit it. Uh, the Apostle Paul, and, and talking about that, when, when he wrote his letter uh, to the church at Rome, Romans chapter 7, and, uh, and verse 10. Uh, well, that's still hard for me to read. All right. The fact that it's called a new covenant implies that it is better. Uh, and I thought I had this up here, Paul's statement. Uh, the law promised life, but instead of giving life, it gave death. Now, that's what Paul talked about specifically in Romans chapter 7 and verse 10. Uh, Paul's talking about his life as a Jew growing up under that law. His expectations in life was that that law would be able to give life to him. And that's something that all the Jews believed. Uh, that by their living by that law and under that law as God's children, that that guaranteed them eternal life. But Paul says, that law which I thought would give life, he said, I found to bring death. That's Romans chapter 7 and verse 10. And so here's the fault with that old law that God had given. It couldn't give life. It could only condemn. Anytime someone sinned, they came under the condemnation of that law. They've broken that law. They have violated God's will for them. That law could give life, but only what? What's the stipulation to the law being able to give life to anyone? You had to keep that law perfectly. Turn over to the book of Leviticus, chapter 18, and verse 5, I believe, is the passage. Better. Who can read verse 5 for us there, Leviticus chapter 18? Anyone have that? You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. Okay. God says you shall keep. Uh, this the NIV says you shall keep my decrees and laws, for the man who obeys them will live by them. I am the Lord. If you wanted to live... With God's blessings, if you wanted to have life, then you had to keep that law, all of it. As soon as you broke any of those laws, you became guilty uh, of breaking that law, and that sin separated you from God. And so it couldn't give life. It could only condemn when someone has done that which is wrong. And so it brought death when it was violated. And so 
it could not give them what they were looking for. And so the writer here gives a contrast over and over about that old law and the new law that we have and several different things he says about it. Number one, we've talked about this. The old law was a law written on stones. If you remember uh, when Moses went up on that mountain, he's up there for 40 days, and God gives him the Ten Commandments. And when he comes down, he finds the people involved in sin, and Moses became angry. What did he do with the Ten Commandments? He threw them down and broke them. Somebody said he broke all Ten Commandments at once. <laughs> well, he broke it. And so later on, God calls him back up on the mountain, and God told him to chisel out some stones, and God said, I will write them again on that. And so this law that God had given to them is written in stone. But the new law that God has given to us it is a, a law that's written in our minds and on our hearts. And so it's something that controls us from within, not without, uh, that God's given to us. And so it's different in that respect that we have that from God. Under the old law, we've mentioned this too, that under the old law, one was born physically into a covenant relationship with God. If you were born a Jew, by that very fact, you're in a covenant relationship with God. If you're a male, when you're eight days old, you have to be circumcised. And that you know, is an important thing to keep you in that covenant relationship with God. If anyone's not circumcised, they're cut off. They're not in it. But now, we mentioned this last week, that those children, when they're born, don't know anything about God. They don't know anything about God's requirements. They know nothing about His law, what they must do, what they can't do. And so, even though they're born into that covenant relationship with God, it's only afterwards that they have to learn about God. And they have to learn about God's law. So you became uh, His child, as it were, by physical birth, and then later you had to learn about Him. But it's not that way in the New Covenant. In fact, in the New Covenant, it's, it's completely opposite. Under the New Law, a person had to learn about God and His Son first before He could be born into that family. You know, when the Bible talks about that in the book of, of Romans, it mentions the fact that one has to hear the Gospel, but it points out how, how can a person believe in Christ unless he hears and how can he hear unless someone is sent and so they have to hear the word of God being preached that would lead them to believe in Christ and then learning from it what they need to do in order to become his child and, and when they are baptized into Christ at that time they're added to the body of Christ one doesn't join the church God adds you to it and he adds you to that church when you're obedient to him and becoming his child in being baptized. And so you had to learn about God and about His will for you before you could become His child. And so that's why when uh, you read about it there in Jeremiah, and Jeremiah talks about it, that statement is made that uh, there'll no longer be, you know, every man has to teach his brother, sister, because he says all of them shall know, uh, because you can't be in His kingdom unless you first of all come to a knowledge of who God is, of who Christ is, and the knowledge of what's required of you in order to become a child. So different from that old covenant that God had given to the Jews is this new covenant that God's given to us. Then the old law, uh, boy, I just can't read that. Under the old law, sins were remembered. How often were they remembered? Every year, on the Day of Atonement, sacrifices had to be made for the entire nation. But there were other times when an individual might sin and he might be required to come to the priest with an animal to be sacrificed uh, in order that he might be forgiven of those sins. But he wasn't really forgiven at that time. Those sins weren't really taken away. Now, in their mind, as far as they were concerned, everything's right between them and God. They're in a right relationship. And that's because God is looking forward to that day when the perfect sacrifice will be made, when His Son will come and die on the cross for everybody, and sins can really be taken away. But they weren't. And that's why every year there's a remembrance made of those sins when sacrifices have to be made again for the entire nation. But that's under the old law. Under the new law, sins were remembered no more. That's the promise that God had made to them.
And that's the statement that, that's given here when he talks about it. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12, when God says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. It's a big, big difference between this new law God's given and that old law. Under the old law, those sins are always being remembered. You're continually making sacrifice. But under the New Testament, that new law that God's given, the one sacrifice of His Son is sufficient to take away all sins forever. And there will be no remembrance of those sins against us. And speaking of the new covenant, God, He says, has made that first covenant old. And that just stands to reason you understand that. If you talk about a new covenant, that implies there's an old covenant. And so that old covenant he talks about is one that has become old. Uh, and Brother Pace, in commenting about this, he said, the very fact that a new covenant was prophesied showed that the old one had faults. There would have been no point in giving a new covenant if the old one had been perfect. You know, if that old law that God had given to the Jews, if that had been a perfect covenant for God's people, then why would you ever need another one? Why would you get rid of that which is perfect for something else? You would never do that. It kind of fits the old adage that I've heard so many times, and I don't know where it originated or, or whatever, but I've heard several people use it. If it ain't fixed or if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, if you've got something and it's working, it's not broken, then don't try to fix it. Don't try to improve upon it. You're liable to mess it up. Well, if that old law was perfect, if it was doing what needed to be done and people were being saved by that old law, then why would you ever need a new one? You wouldn't do that. And so he's right. The mention of a new covenant, a new law, implies that that old covenant uh, has to be replaced. In fact, in, in verse 13, uh, that statement is made. For in that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old? is ready to vanish away. It's obsolete. What does that mean? What? Passed on? Passed on? Well, it's outlived its usefulness. Uh, that's the basic meaning for it here. It's obsolete. Uh, you, have, you have things in life that become obsolete. Uh, you know... Used to, you know, you could just about any street corner, you could find a telephone booth. You can't find them anymore. They're obsolete. Why? You don't need them. Everybody's got, if they don't have a, a, a cell phone, and most everybody has a cell phone, uh, they at least have a land phone in their own house. Uh, several years ago when Don and I were down in Belize, and we were, teaching there in the, in the school they had there in Belize City. And at the end of that, we went down to uh, PG uh, to check on the church there and see how things were going. And, and we're driving along, and I see a lady coming out of this thatched uh, house, thatched roof, and just old boards stuck in the ground with a thatched roof around. And she's coming out, walking out to the highway, and she's got a cell phone in her hand. And I told Don, I said, that's it. We are officially the last two people on earth without a cell phone. <laughs> and, and we, you, know, you know, the old phones they used to have are obsolete. You know, there, there's no use for them anymore because everybody's got, you know, either a cell phone or at least, at the very least, they have a, a land phone at home they can use. So they don't need the pay phones anymore. Uh, well, I think they still have them in prison. And that's really useless because most of the prisoners have cell phones. They're not supposed to, but they have them. Uh, they'll do sweeps ever periodically, and they'll come away with 100, 200 cell phones every time. Uh, so the, it's an obsolete. Now, that's in contrast to another word that's used, archaeos. Uh, you can almost hear the word archaic in it, a, a word that, that's used of that which is ancient or old. But the word for obsolete is this word Paleo, and according to Trench, he said this is the word that is always used of that which is old in the sense of more or less worn out. This might be due to age or use. Uh, just the fact that that law has been around so long. 
uh, that it's worn out, it's not needed any longer, or that it's used by people. Uh, it shows that it's no longer needed. And that certainly would be the case because through all the use they had of that old law, it never accomplished what they were looking for. It never got them complete remission of sins. It never got to them to that point of having eternal life. And so that old law, uh, it, it says, is obsolete. And, he says, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And so that old law, he says, is ready to vanish away. And that, that's interesting, too. The, the American Standard Version uh, uses the expression that it is nigh to vanishing away. And that simply means it's near. Uh, it's not just vanishing away. It's near to that point of vanishing away. Now, I believe that the old law, the power for removing that old law, was in the death of Christ. And that's why when Paul talks about it, he says that that old law was, was nailed to the cross and taken out of the way. Uh, that was the power behind it. But the old law in its use didn't really occur until the destruction of Jerusalem and destruction of the temple. Uh, today, there are Jews who still try to worship God under the old law, but they, they don't have a temple anymore. They can't make sacrifices. They don't have anybody to serve as a priest. They have no way of knowing if any of the Jews now living would qualify to serve as a priest because they've lost all contacts with those genealogies they used to keep up. They don't have anything like that anymore. And so there's no way to know. And so when Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was destroyed, that's when it really passed away because they were no longer able to live according to that old law that God had given. And so as he talks about it here, he says, that which is obsolete and is growing old is ready to vanish away. It's near to vanishing away. And, and it was only about five years or so after this book was written that the city of Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. Uh, and so at that time, it had passed away. And so that old law, that old covenant that God had given to the Jewish people it is a law that's no longer in effect, and people cannot live by that law today. They can't do what needs to be done. Now, just some special thought about this. When he, when he talks about that old covenant and the new covenant, he's really talking about the old law and the new law. Uh, there, there are several things about this. In, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 29 and, and verse 21, I don't know if I put that up here or not. I guess not. All right. Uh, but Deuteronomy 29, 21 says, And the Lord would separate him from all the tribes of Israel for adversity, according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in the book of the law. The covenant, including the curses of the covenant, are written in the book of the law. You're not talking about two different things here. They're all part and parcel of the same thing. And so when that old covenant passed away, that's the old law passing away. And the new covenant that God is bringing in is the New Testament. Uh, interesting here, look at some of the things about this. and uh, just, just for interest maybe to you to know this, uh, there, there's a Greek word, synthiki, uh, which means a compact. Uh, a covenant or a treaty uh, that could be used and, and would sometimes be used, translated as covenant, but it has to do with a covenant in which both parties are on an equal basis. And so to use that word would suggest that man and God in making this covenant are on an equal basis, and that's not the case. And so when the Septuagint, when the Greek translation of the Old Testament is made, they opted not to use that word, syntyche, but they use the word diatheke, which means literally a will or a testament. Now, interestingly enough, it can sometimes mean covenant, and sometimes in the New Testament it's translated as covenant. But, but look in Hebrews chapter 9. We haven't gotten to that point yet, but uh, along this line I want to look at this. Chapter 9, and I want to look at uh, verses 15 through 20. And I'm reading that from the... Uh, New King James. 
He says, and for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant. That's that same word, diatheke. By means of death or the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, diatheke, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, diatheke, translated covenant the first two times, but now here translated as testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament, diatheke, is a force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator liveth. And so this covenant that we're talking about, that old covenant new covenant, is talking about the old law and the new law. And so when it says that old covenant is obsolete, it's growing old and it's ready to pass away, to vanish away, that's talking about the old law, that law of Moses. Yes, sir? Right, yeah. So he, he was still living under that old law, ruled by it. But none of us today are living under that old law. That old law has been removed, and it's been replaced by a new covenant, a new testament that God has given to us. Uh, the Westminster, New Westminster Dictionary of the Bible uh, says about this, that the word covenant and testament in verses 16 and 17, uh, would have been, it would have been impossible to render that word there by covenant and so accordingly, testament is used. If you read the Revised Standard Version, and I think the New International Version, it uses the word will. Uh, and we're familiar with a will, and then he goes on to talk about it, that a will or a new a testament becomes effective after men are dead. And so that old law was effective until Christ died and took it out of the way. But now we're under a new covenant, a new testament that God's given to us. And, and over and over again, you see that in, in that uh, book of uh, Galatians that I was talking about a while ago. It's just over and over again you find it. In fact, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24 talks about the reason that law was given. That old covenant was not given to us in order to save men from their sins because it couldn't do that. Uh, there were faults with it. And the Hebrew writer talks about because there are faults in that old covenant, that's the reason why it had to be taken out of the way. It couldn't save. It could only condemn. Uh, so those were the faults with it. But the purpose for the old law was to bring us to Christ who could once and for all times take away all our sins. And we could be saved eternally. But that was a new covenant that God gave through His Son. So, yes, sir. They make, a, many of them, I don't know about all of them, but many of them make a distinction between what they call the ceremonial law and the moral law. For them, the moral law is the Ten Commandments, and they say that remains. But the ceremonial law, animal sacrifices and things of that nature, that's part of the law that's been taken away. But the Bible doesn't make any distinction uh, uh, about the old law having ceremonial and moral. Uh, it doesn't make a distinction about it. And as it talks about it here, the law, that old law, that old covenant has been taken away. And that old covenant includes the Ten Commandments because specific mention is made about that. Uh, so that has been taken out of the way. Now, one of the things here in chapter 8 that I want to look at, we, we moved over this verse, but uh, in, in chapter 8 and verse 9, uh, where, where God there uh, speaks uh, as a father uh, to his child. Israel is his child, and God is the Father. And so, verse 9 says, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. When Israel was down in Egypt in captivity, and God leads them out of there uh, to freedom, uh, He talks about it here. God says, it, it, it was uh, I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand 
to lead them out of the land of Egypt. As if Israel was like a child and they did not know how to escape that bondage in Egypt. They didn't know how to get out. And so God came down as a father toward them. And until God took them in His hand, took their hand in His hand, and led them out of that land. To me, that talks about the, the love that God has for His people. That He is like a father and we're like His children. And, of, and, and the same thing is mentioned in, in the book of Hosea, chapter 11 and verse 3. And, and this is something that uh, is quoted in the uh, New Testament in regard to Christ. But Hosea 11 and verse 3. God says, Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. Ephraim, that's Israel, God's people. And God is treating them like His child and, and His loving, tender care for them. Uh, when God says, it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. Uh, you know, I've, I've been noticing recently uh, with the new children around here, I notice it primarily, it seems like, with the, with the grandfathers. I don't see Skip in here right now, but, but Skip is one of them. I've noticed him with little Joshua holding him by the hands and walking. He him and everyone walked him all the way down this aisle. Got up there and let go of him, and then Joshua climbed up the steps. So you had to get him down. But that, that idea of just holding him by the hands, teaching him how to walk. And that, that's kind of what God has done for Israel, His people. It, it's like a father teaching his child the tenderness that God has in a relationship for them. And I think that's important for us to understand. You know, God loves Israel. They were His chosen people. He loves us, the new Israel, because we're His chosen people. We've chosen to obey Him and become His children, and He's chosen to save us and to help us out. Now, when we come to uh, chapter 9, it's a continuation on of helping us to understand, you know, we've already talked about Christ is better than the angels. Uh, he's better than uh, Aaron. His priesthood is better than the Aaronic priesthood. Uh, his covenant is better than the Old Testament covenant that the people had uh, through Moses. But when he gets to chapter 9, he's going to be talking about those Old and New Testament uh, sacrifices were made and how sacrifices made for us today are superior to that. But he's also going to talk about uh, that tabernacle that the Jews had, uh, that uh, God gave instruction for that to Moses, and they built that, and comparing what they had with what we have today. And in spite of the fact that that old covenant that God made with them and that tabernacle they had and later on the temple that took the place of the tabernacle, in spite of all the riches that were poured into that, they could never provide for man what he needed and cannot compare with what we have today in God's glorious kingdom, the church here on earth and what God has done for us. And so that's what he's going to be looking at here in this, this chapter, chapter 9. And I'd like to begin just by looking it may be, say, the first five verses of this. Uh, talking about here the temporary Levitical sacrifices that were given. So looking at verses 1 through 5. And he makes a statement there. says, Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service. And the... Man, let me try reading off this. I can't read that. Uh, for indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstead, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. There are a lot of things that he says here in regard to that, that tabernacle they had. And there are some things that are talked about here that cause problems for us in understanding it. First of all, though, he, he talks about that first covenant, the old law, had ordinances for divine service. Now, when, when, when I read that, I didn't pay too much attention to it, but... Brother Neil Lightfoot, in his comments on this, drew attention to one word, the word had. Now, what's significance about that? Sir? It's past tense. And so he talks about that, that 
first covenant had ordinances, a divine service that he talks about, and that tabernacle was prepared, the first part of which was the lampstand and so forth. It had ordinances. And so there are no laws today in regard to that tabernacle they had because that's part of that old law that's been taken away. <coughs> and that's not something for us today. The Revised Standard translation of that verse says, Now even the first covenant had regulations for divine worship and an earthly sanctuary. And so there were regulations. There were rules that God had for its use. Uh, but that's past tense. Now that's not today because that law has been removed. Uh, Brother Burton Kaufman writing about this says, Beginning here is a detailed and extensive contrast between that worldly sanctuary, whether you're talking about the tabernacle or the temple, which was the center of the Jewish religion, uh, and with the heavenly counterpart of it, which is the grand theater of the redemptive ministry of Jesus. You've got that Old Testament covenant that had the sanctuary, the tabernacle, and later the temple, and, and that can't compare with what we have today in, in God's temple, the church, uh, where God... Uh, dwells among his people today. So as we look at that, the sanctuary that he talks about there is a reference to the tabernacle as a whole. That includes both the holy place and the most holy place. And what he's going to do is look at each of these individually and notice what's found in each of them and notice uh, something, I guess, about the, the richness of those things about it. Uh, but he uses the word earthly. And uh, I think the King James uses the word worldly. Usually when you hear the word worldly, especially as it's used a lot of times in the Bible, what, what does that mean to you? If you talk about somebody, they say, well, that's a worldly person. What, what does that mean? A sinful person. Somebody that's living like the world, not like God would want. And, but we need to understand when he talks about the sanctuary being an earthly sanctuary, or being a worldly sanctuary, the King James, it doesn't mean it's something evil. Uh, that, that God had them to create. But it's talking simply about it's something of this world. In fact, I like the way the, the American Standard uh, renders that. It says, Now even a first covenant had ordinances of divine service and its sanctuary, a sanctuary of this world. Now what's the sanctuary that Christ ministers in? The church. And He is ministering to it in heaven. So it's not of this earth. It's of heaven. And so that's the contrast that he's making about it. That tabernacle was an earthly thing. But now, just, just look at it. Now you talk about the furniture that's there in that. Uh, uh, and the word sanctuary, like to talk about both of them. So look at the furniture of it. Number one, there's the lampstand in it. Uh, the lampstand that gives light inside the holy place. You, you've got the base, you've got the, the shaft of it, and then you've got, on either side of that, three branches coming off, so you've got a total of seven uh, lights there for it. <clears throat> and when it was built, interestingly enough, in the Old Testament, the Bible tells us how much gold was used in building it. The lampstand was built out of pure gold. So it's the best gold that's been refined, uh, and, and that's all that's in it, is gold. One talent was used. One talent of gold to build that. Now, don't know for sure, but the, the normal talent that was used uh, was something that weighed about 75 pounds. So you think about 75 pounds of gold in, in our money today. Uh, gold fluctuates, but it's usually somewhere around 1600 to $1,700 an ounce. <clears throat> so if you've got 75 pounds of gold in this, you're looking at something that would be roughly around $1,980,000. That's a lot of money in one little lamp. Uh, now, other things that are there we're going to talk about have a lot of gold in them, but we don't know how much gold. And, and I think it's almost impossible to try to guess how much it is, but, but there's a lot of money involved in the furnishing here of this. Uh, in addition to that, if you... I had a picture there, you can see a lot of it. You can go online, and, and they'll do close-ups of this, pointing out, you know, the different parts of it. You, you've got the knobs, you've got the flowers, and so forth on it. And all of that has to be made out of pure gold uh, that it has there. 
and something like that. Close to $2 million in worth. But in addition to that, you have also the table for the showbread that is there. <clears throat> it's a table described in the Old Testament to be built. It would have been about, in our measurements today, about three feet long, one and a half feet wide, and two feet, three inches high. It was to be overlaid with pure gold. It was made out of acacia wood, but it's overlaid with pure gold. We don't know how thick it was, so it's kind of hard to know exactly how much gold is used in it. There had to be four rings of gold put at the corners, the four corners of it, uh, and that's so they could have poles put through it, the poles made of acacia wood, but again, overlaid with pure gold. They didn't use that for transporting. So uh, again, how much gold was used there, we don't know. Uh, it would be hard to estimate. But just looking at that, all of this is overlaid with pure gold. Uh, again, there's a, a lot of wealth involved in that. And then on top of it, you have 12 loaves of bread uh, arranged in two rows, six in each row. Uh, and that bread was eaten by the priest every Sabbath day. And, and then when they were through eating it, 12 new loaves were put on it, and they would be eaten the next Sabbath. And so, so they have that that's there uh, in the, uh, the holy place of it that is given. Now, there are different images that I've seen of this. Uh, some of them show the image without the poles in it. Uh, but, you know, and there are different ideas of what it looked like. But still, uh, to be, have something like this overlaid with gold. Again, it's an emphasis to me that when we're talking about the old law, the covenant that God had, made, it is primarily something that is centered upon physical things and upon physical wealth. Whereas in the church, it's more centered on spiritual things and a great, great difference in them. Now, in addition to this, then it talks about the, the furniture that's in the most holy place. And this is where we begin to have some problems with some things that are being said. There are things that I think <coughs> have a reasonable explanation for it, but when you think about the most holy place it has there, the Holy of Holies, as he talks about it here, in chapter 9, uh, has two pieces of article of furniture in it. Uh, the golden censer, or the golden altar, uh, altar of incense there uh, in it. Uh, and this is, this is one of the problems. The first problem we have in, in thinking about this, uh, the golden censer that he talks about. Uh, and there's an image of what that altar of incense would have looked like. Now, there are two problems uh, that, are, that are generally pointed out about this. Number one, some translations say golden censer. The King James does, and I know the New King James that I'm using says golden censer. Other newer translations say altar of incense. And it's hard to know for sure just by the translation of that word what's meant because the Greek word that is used there is a word that literally means that upon which or in which Incense can be placed. Well, a censer is something you can put incense in it. An altar of incense is something you can put incense on. Both of them would fit the, the word that's being used here, so you can't know just by the, the word itself what they're talking about. And so you have to try to figure it out. And uh, so here, here's one idea that's being expressed about this when we talk about it. I think I put this up there. That, that's the Greek word that's used there, thuman to carry on. Uh, but that's one problem. The second problem is, where is it to be found? Uh, look in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 30 and verse 6. We don't have much time. I want to get through this. Exodus chapter 30 and verse 6. It says, And you shall put it, talking about the uh, altar of incense, you shall put it before the veil that is before the ark of the testimony before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I meet with you. So this is God's instruction He gave to Moses in building the tabernacle. And when He talks about this altar of incense, He says you are to put it before the veil that is before the ark. Well, if you look at it. Uh, now, here, let me show up here. This is the veil that it's talking about. The veil is before the ark of the covenant, right there in the most holy place. But the altar of incense, he says, is to be put before the veil. So under the law, it has the altar of incense in the holy place. 
But now, here in, in chapter 9, in verse 4, he talks about it. He says, which had the golden, inc- golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were, and he goes on and on and on. But it places both the Ark of the Covenant and the golden censer in the Holy of Holies. So, could the writer of Hebrews messed up that much that, that he's got it in the wrong place? And that's why I talk about this, this is a problem that sometimes occurs. And I think, first of all, when we talk about the translation, I think, personally, uh, that he's talking here about an altar of incense. A couple of reasons why. Number one, there's no mention anywhere in the Old Testament of a golden censer being a part of the furniture in the most holy place. He never talks about it. Now, if it's talking about a golden censer here, that means that when the Hebrew writer talks about the tabernacle of God, he doesn't say a thing about one of the most important pieces of furniture, the altar of incense. And it was extremely important. We'll see why in a few minutes, uh, the importance of it. Uh, but there are also some other things that are said about it in the Bible that would help us understand that the ark of the co- or this ark of the not the Ark of the Covenant, the altar of incense could not be in the most holy place. Uh, some of the verses here, let's see if I put these up here. All right. Uh, Exodus chapter 30, verse 7 and 8. It says, Aaron shall burn on it, talking about the altar of incense, Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense every morning when he tends the lambs. He shall burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense on it a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Now, if that ark, oh, excuse me, I keep saying that, if that altar of incense is in the most holy place, that means Aaron has got to go into that most holy place every day of the week to burn incense on it. But he can't do that. Uh, Leviticus chapter 16 and, and verse 2 And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. So God says, Moses, you better warn your brother Aaron not to come into that most holy place that's on the inside of the the, uh, the veil. That's the most holy place where the ark of the covenant is. If he goes in there, any other time other than that day of atonement, he'd be killed by God. But he's got to burn incense on that altar of incense every day. So that altar cannot be in the most holy place. It's got to be in the holy place for him to do that. So it may be, at least some speculate, that that the statement that's made here by the author of Hebrews, when, when he talks about that altar being inside where the Ark of the Covenant is, it may simply be because of the fact that that altar of incense uh, has great connections with the most holy place. And here's why. Uh, this, is, this is found in Exodus chapter 30 and, and verse 10. It says, And Aaron shall make atonement upon its horns. That's the horns of the altar of incense. You have to look at the context to see that's what he's talking about. And Aaron shall make atonement upon its horns once a year. That's the day of atonement. With the blood of the sin offering of atonement. Once a year he shall make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy to the Lord. That altar of incense just wasn't for burning incense. But on the day of atonement, Aaron had to take blood of those animals sacrificed and put it on the horns of that altar of incense. And he makes a statement here about it that he's to do that once a year. He shall make atonement for it. Sins are expiated in part when that blood is put on the altars of the altar of incense, the horns of the altar of incense. But see, that blood also has to be carried into the most holy place and sprinkled before the Ark of the Covenant and then sprinkled upon the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant. That's where atonement is made. But there's also atonement made by putting that blood on the altar of incense. So there's a connection between it and the holy places. So some are speculating, maybe that's why he refers to the Ark of incense being inside the holy place. It's not there literally, but it's there in relation to it because they both have to do with making uh, appreciation for sins uh, on that occasion. Then maybe one other thing. Brother Martel Pace, and we have to go, our time's gone. Martel Pace suggested uh, 
that on the Day of Atonement, the high priest has to go back and forth into that holy place several times. And so what they would do is pull that veil back across, and so it's left open because he's got to go back and forth several times on that day. And when he does it, you've got the altar of sin, incense is set before that veil. And when that veil is pushed back, right up against that is the Ark of the Covenant. And so looking at it that way, it looks as if it's part of that Holy of Holies. Uh, just speculation, but that may be part of it. But it may just be a connection. Uh, I do not believe that the book here gives us an error being made by uh, uh, the writer of Hebrews. Now, there are other possibilities. It may be not talk about the Ark of the Covenant at all. Maybe talk about a censor. But that there are some problems with that also. But anyhow, I uh, appreciate your being here and your uh, being patient with me. Let's have a brief word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, once again, we thank you for all the love that you have for us in this life and thankful that we live at a time where we have a better covenant, where we have a better covenant based upon better promises, where we have a greater high priest that serves us. And grateful, Father, for all that we have by thy mercy and grace in this time. We pray you'll dismiss us in your care and safety, Father, and bless us and bring us back again this Wednesday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.